This is a video in the series of videos on LC3 programming. Specifically, we're going to be looking at subroutines, the concept of a subroutine. Subroutines are also known in different languages as methods, functions, procedures, or simply a sub program. The important thing about a subroutine that is for us it's a callable unit which means it is some piece of code that one can call to get a particular function done or a particular procedure done or some particular sub programming aspect fulfilled. So the important thing about a subroutine is that when we invoke the subroutine so there is a the subroutine because it's a callable unit let's call it let's use the terms callee which is the callable unit and the caller which is the one that invokes the invokes the callable unit so the way the caller invokes the callable unit is by an instruction which is a new instruction in our repertoire called jump to subroutine JSR and jump to subroutine gives the name of the call callable unit let's just call it a unit some unit that we want to call so it's it it has a look and feel of a branch to this particular location the only difference is the act of calling this will result in the control getting transferred from here to here but an important thing happens in this process which is the the ISA the machine keeps track of where this call was invoked which means if let's say the call was invoked at an address of x 301a let's say then in addition to the PC being set to this let's say this guy was running at x35 or let's use a different number let's say it was running at 302a then the the PC as we know is set to this value but what we also do is as a byproduct we also set R7 to be equal to the address where we want to return so then address where we want to come back after the service is complete or the subroutine is completed is 301b x 301b so this is automatically done for us by the by the architecture in its isa in its implementation now the routine itself is completed and when the routine completes it's going to do a and implement an instruction which is a jump R7 and jump R7 will result in our control coming back here in other words jump R7 all it really does is it sets the PC back to whatever the R7 value is so it's important that this callable unit does not destroy R7 if it were to use R7 for some purpose then it should it should save it and restore it so to recap the JSR JSR does two is a two-step process the first step is PC set the value of the address of whatever unit is so that's done using a PC relative addressing mode which is PC plus offset to the unit that's the first step and the actually that's the second step and the first step is first we save R7 with whatever the current value of PC is and the current value of PC when I'm executing this instruction is 301b and the return is just one single step which is this is also has in IS in LC3 there is a synonym for this which is simply the word RET 
RET is just a short form for jump R7. So let's take a look at a problem that we can solve using using some subroutine so you can see the point of subroutines so the problem i'm going to solve is is to print the octal representation of a number stored at x 4000 and our program itself is going to run at x 3000 so we will we will do what we um, normally do when we when we think of solving a problem is we do what is called a top down decomposition of our problem in other words we think of the big picture that is when we draw a flow chart we will think something like oh here's my start of my program here is the start of my program and I will think of the big picture of what I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do is um, in other so the idea behind our uh, rep conversion is if you have a number um, if you have a number let's say uh, let's represent the number as num so remember that to get an octal representation, we will take this number and successively divide it by 8. We divide it by 8, we get the quotient, we get the remainder, and we divide it again by 8. We get uh, new values, so let's say this is my first remainder, R1, we get R2, this is Q1, and then we divide it again by 8, and we get a new quotient and a new remainder and we keep doing this process still till we have a value of quotient which is zero and that's when we know our our procedure has ended so wherever that is wherever whenever that happens so we're going to use this idea but inherent to doing this is that we're going to first take our number let's say num num is going to come into some register We'll get num into some register, let's say R0. And we will take this num and then we will do a divide by 8. So we'll say div by 8. If we divide this number by 8, then we're going to get a quotient and a remainder. So what we'll do is we'll take this remainder and just store it. Store remainder and set quotient the set the value of r naught that we got so reset r naught to be the be the quotient so we assume that this guy divide by 8 takes a single input which is r naught and produces two outputs which are the quotient and the remainder and so we set the quotient back to this and we go back and we repeat this process so notice that this this statement here which is divide by 8 is not a simple instruction usually when we write our flow chart we put in boxes we put a simple instruction but this is not this is actually a a, a function or a or a method or a subroutine we're gonna write so we we uh, use this convention where we put this in a box with these special lines to indicate that this is actually a function So this is the big picture. So we're not done yet So then we we're gonna do this process and then we're gonna come out of this and we'll do other steps and so on But that's the that's the idea of Decomposing our top-down decomposition and then we'll revisit this function and write it so rather than uh, describe the entire function, I'm going to first show you the big picture and then we're going to come back to the details. So here is, here is the solution and I'm going to change my screen format so I can use the... So this is our big picture. So let me shrink it a little bit. So we're, our program is going to run at, at x 
3000 um, and what we're going to do as a part of this code is we're going to compute the octal string and store it here for now we made it 10 10 a block of 10 locations so for example if let's say my input the input location x4000 if the memory contents of let's say x4000 are a number let's take the number let's say it is uh, currently equal to equal to um, 12 then we know that the procedure is going to involve divide by 8 which will give me a quotient of 1 and a remainder of uh, 4 and then I do, do it again uh, 8 and I get a quotient of 0 with a remainder of 1 and the answer is 1 4 so 12 in base 10 is 1 4 in base 8 so we should write them out this way so but what we're going to do right now is we in the octal string location this part of our code which is from here to all the way till here is going to compute the character one at a time and it's going to write them out here so it writes one it computes four it writes four then it computes one it writes one and then it writes a zero this is the part where we're going to run null terminate it because all all of uh, these are ASCII for ASCII 1 and that's the ASCII 0 but this is an ASCII character for ASCII character 1 and so on so that's I'm going to put them in quotes so this is where we're asking adding the ASCII offset to the number as we compute it and so I'll let you review this um, offline um, but the important thing is we've computed it but we find out that once we do that we have them in the wrong order if I were to print this I'll print 4 1 and not 1 0 so I have another other routine here which is gonna reverse the string so this this routine the purpose of this routine is to is to re re visit this string and convert it so it's no longer gonna be like this it's gonna be in place it's gonna become a 1 4 and a zero and then once I have that I'm gonna just call trap x22 which is gonna display it out to the screen so that's the big picture so now we're gonna fill in this the low-level detail so let's first look at this function that we're gonna write which is the divide by 8 function so we're gonna write this function this is divide by 8 so or this subroutine called divide by 8 so here is divide by 8 and it's it's a convention to always write your function with a comment above that explains exactly what this function does and this particular function it says its name is divide by 8 it's a subroutine divides a number by 8 and returns a quotient and remainder input outputs if there are no outputs you just leave that if there are no inputs you leave that but you put a note saying what it is so this is the R0 which is a dividend or what you're dividing and it's aut automatically dividing by 8 and we get a quotient and a remainder and um, for now I'll, I'll let you um, skip this statement understanding the statement here but let's do the rest of the code so divide by 8 is successive subtraction of the number 8 so we do an add of minus 8 and we repeat this process of successively subtracting and keeping a counter of how many subtracts we've done and when we finish subtracting um, and it, there's no more to subtract we come here we we fix it and then we return so this is our main instruction to return this is our return instruction the one of the things that we always insist on is a subroutine which is in this case subroutines have to be clean must be clean what I mean by must be clean is in this particular case because of the way I'm doing this R0 has being is being modified it is being modified successively dividing is going to subtract it subtract it and it's modified R0 R so when the caller receives this call uh, re receives control back they'll 
they'll see that R0 has been destroyed. So one of the things to be clean is what we say as this uh, another way for another way of looking at is this is called Kali saves. That is any mess that this caller Kali creates is going to fix it. So because we're destroying R0, we're going to save it and we're going to restore it. So we're not using another register because that will destroy another register. Instead, we allocate a memory location. This is, I'm using a name dv save r0, r0, and I'm creating a block word for that. I'm going to save it and I'm going to restore it. So I'm saving at the beginning and before I leave, I'm going to restore it so that the caller does not see the messed up r0 but sees the r0 that they originally had. So let's, let's take a look at the reverse string operation now this is a reverse string operation it's much bigger only because I have right now a, a bunch of saves that I need to do because this particular routine to reverse a string is using several registers it is using four five registers for to do its work and it's also using R7 this is an exception and we'll see why that's the case in just a second. It's using this R7, which is an important thing, which is because I am going to call, as part of doing my work, I'm going to call another function called string length. So what typically happens when you, if in, in our case, the main program is somewhere, it's going to call JSR it's called calling JSR reverse string. Reverse string is a subroutine which somewhere in its code it's calling JSR string length. We're going to use the string length to compute how long the string is so that when we know how long the string is we're going to first we compute how long it is and then we swap these two and then we move on, we swap the next two and we move on. And so in order to know which one is the last element, we need to know the length of the string. So first we're going to compute the length of the string, which is what we're doing here. So, so string length is another function. So what's happening when we, when we call these functions, the control from here to here goes here. R7 is currently holding the address of whatever this is. Let's call that A. R7 is holding address A. Now, when I make a call from here to here, R7 is holding the value, let's say this is B. So this one finishes and he calls jump R7, which is good because that's going to bring control back here. And this one executes and he calls jump R7. But R7 currently has been destroyed. So what is going to happen is he's going to go back here rather than go back here. So he needs to go back here, but he's, he's stuck in this place. So one of the things we're going to do is make sure that when a subroutine calls another subroutine, we have to make sure that this this subroutine is going to save R7 and he's going to restore R7. So he's, he has a save location for R7 here where he's going to write this A value and when he restores it, so he's going to write the A value and then he's going to read the A value. So this is no longer going there, he's going to come back to this location. So it's very important that if a subroutine calls another subroutine, you have to you have to make sure that R7 has not been destroyed. So this is how we accomplish it. Now this code itself is pretty straightforward. I found the string length, and this is here. This is where I'm doing the swap of the two look swap of the two, and then I'm de incrementing this pointer, the front pointer, decrementing the back pointer. These are my decrements. And then I'm going to check if they crossed each other. If they crossed each other, if I haven't crossed each other, I go back and I repeat this process. So let's, let's run this code in the simulator. So here's my code. Um, this is the entire code. So we're going to um, assemble it, 
run it and let's go ahead and put a value at x 4000 let's put um, a value let's say I put the value um, let's now for a simple ex for the simple case we're just gonna put the number 12 and um, and then we're gonna go back to our x3000 and start running our code so uh, one of the things we see is when we navigate our sub uh, navigate code or step in our code we can do step over which is what we've been doing mostly for this at this point so when I say step over I go past the instruction step over and and now I'm gonna do a step over but when I have a jump to subroutine which is this instruction I can step in to the function so I go step in so that will take me to that function wherever that function is which happens to be right here this is the function I'm, I'm going to be visiting and so in this function I am this is the this is the divide by 8 function so I'm going to find out the quotient and the remainder here I can step over step over um, I can even put a breakpoint right there at the very end and I'm going to say it's continue so it's going to get all the way there and I know that this function said that it's going to compute the quotient and the remainder the quotient is one the remainder is four so it's doing what it's supposed to do so i'm gonna um, step over i get back to my original location which is this location in my main program which is where r7 which is what r7 had in it 3004 so i go, go back there and then i can repeat this process let me show you another instance here which we're going to Put a breakpoint right here and we say continue at this point we will notice that our our um, uh, octal string had a value of 52 and that's four and it should have had a one here at 3011 well we'll see what's going on so let's continue actually I'm gonna just run this code and I reach the reverse string when I reach the reverse string I notice that the number 1 and 4 are there in the string but they're in the reverse order so I'm gonna um, step into this and notice right now r7 has 3004 but r7 should have 3000 e when we step into it so let's step in and we are inside our subroutine which is reverse string and r7 is the return address now uh, we're gonna do one more step in so let's put a breakpoint right there and let's continue and now we're gonna step into this function again which is string length but r7 was 3000 e but the act of stepping into that will destroy r7 because r7 will have now a 302 d which was the address we would have been returning to but the good thing is that function already saved r7 as part of its execution so if i now step out of this i come back from string length uh, the string length happens to be 2 which is what r1 had in it and and then we we compute our uh, we do our next few steps and then when we get out of here which is the jump r7 you will notice that as part of our our saving we have our saved r7 value which is here so we're going to restore it just before we get out so let's just do that let's continue here and just before we get out r7 was holding some value which is my own r7 own location here but now i'm going to restore it so i'm going to restore it when i step over i get the actual location i have to go to which is 3000 e and so when i step over i come back to my main program which is right there so now i'm just going to call trap hall trap um, x22 which is put s which is already making sure that r0 is holding the address of my string which is this string and they've been now swapped to one four and then i just simply say continue 
and I should see a 1, 4 on the screen. So one of the things that I that we can think of is how do we write a subroutine? When do we choose to write a subroutine? Subroutines are, we said they're callable units. But the most important thing about a callable unit is we're getting reuse from it and we're getting modularity from it. That is, we we think of our problem in terms of 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 uh, programmable chunks and that's what modularity is if you think of your main program your main program might look like i do something i do something which is a, a complicated function and maybe i do something else with it and then i go back and repeat this so this is a callable function we don't normally if i didn't do this then i'd repeat all of the code if this is let's say this function which we wrote which is let's say this is some sub we wrote and if the sub is 100 lines of code then without without decomposing like this we would put all 100 lines here instead we just just put one line here we call those 100 lines and we come back so it's much more readable and modular when you do this. The other nice thing is we could actually reuse this function. So what I mean by reuse is we should always aspire to write, write functions that, are, that serve multiple purposes. For example, if I wrote a multiply function, or for that matter, let's look at the divide by 8. The divide by 8 is actually a not a very good function to write what would have been better so the divide by 8 function if you if you notice is taking a single input in r0 and computing two outputs in r1 and r2 it's computing the quotient and it's computing the remainder imagine if i wrote a better function a divide by and if I div wrote a function which is divide by and gave it two inputs, let's say R0 and R1. And it's going to return uh, R2 and R3, which is the quotient and the remainder. In other words, what it's doing is not just dividing by 8. This divide by 8 is a rather limiting thing. What if I can divide by R1? So this is a much more generic subroutine which has a lot more use usability. So we should try and write routines that are more generic in nature. Because if this were not a convert to octal, let's say let's say I wanted to write a different func different program where we wanted to do something like convert to hex. or convert to decimal then we would have to write a divide by 16 for one a divide by 10 for one instead if we just wrote a divide by all we have to do is we have to for doing divide by 16 we set this guy to be 16 for doing, doing a divide by 10 we set this guy to be 10 so it would be much more generic i hope that convinces you of the usefulness of subroutines.